Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. For a call to worship, I'll be reading from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. So please join us this morning in singing a new song, Battle Belongs. shadows your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear now for I'm safe with you so when I fight I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle Oh 
church family and welcome to online worship at FBC. We are so glad that you can be here to worship together with us virtually, even though we are in so many different places across the region and the world. My name is Katie Gore and I serve as one of the college ministry interns at FBC. If you are new to FBC, we would love to have the chance to get to know you. After our time of worship, please head to our website, fbcamers.org and click connect in the menu at the top of the screen. If you fill out and submit the online form, one of our pastors will reach out to find out how the church can help you and to connect you with our community. Believing that all we have comes from God and belongs to him, we give a portion of our resources back to God out of gratitude for what he has done for us. And we choose to give because it's a way we can invest in what we consider to be God's work not only here among us in this church and in our community, but also around the world. If you'd like to give online to support the many ministries at FBC, you can also do that at fbcamers.org. Just click on the giving link you will find in the menu at the top of the screen, or you can go directly to fbcamers.org give. Please give generously today as God enables you. Now let us come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you, Lord. God, we are so grateful that we have the privilege to come before you, the savior of the world and the creator of the world, God. We come before you today humbly, Lord, and pray that our worship would be pleasing to you as we worship in song and through our giving, God. Lord, we thank you for your enduring love that we have to cling to in times of despair and in times of uncertainty, God. We thank you for the everlasting hope that you offer us through the life and death of your son. Lord, we pray today that our eyes and hearts and ears would be open to your whisperings, Lord, and that we would be attentive to what you have to say. Father, we pray that we would align our hearts to yours and that you would work within us today to do the work of your kingdom here on earth. May we join in the work that you are already doing 
and may we offer worship to you that is pleasing to you. I pray all of this in your son's holy name. Amen. The scripture reading for today's message is found in Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 27. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. This is the word of the Lord. This morning's message comes by popular demand. So many of you have shaped this morning's sermon as throughout the many months of the COVID-19 pandemic, I've received from so many of you emails and texts, or we've had phone calls or Zoom chats, and one of the most predominant themes that many of you have shared with me is I feel vulnerable. I think this is something many of us have been experiencing through this COVID-19 pandemic. We feel more vulnerable because of the stress that's been evoked through this pandemic, because of isolation, where uh, many people are alone and without much human contact and, and not the in-person community that so often uh, helps us to be growing spiritually and to protect each other, or families who are packed into their home or their apartment together, where parents are working hard to keep their jobs, but they need to be working with the education of their children, and their children just want to get out and run around and play and see their friends, or the rampant racism that we've seen in our culture and the injustice and what that can do to us, and then the temptations that many have been feeling and experiencing in this unique season. Many of us are saying, I feel more vulnerable. What we need is spiritual protection. We really need kind of a strategy or a game plan in order for us to proactively protect ourselves and not just survive during this quarantine season, but really thrive spiritually and really grow more in Christ and grow more equipped to follow Christ through this pandemic and through whatever the next tragedy or challenges or temptations or global conflict might be. Well, God speaks to his beloved children with the wisdom of a parent. Our Heavenly Father speaking to his children with love and urgency, especially in Proverbs chapter 4. So will you join me on your device or in your Bible? Proverbs chapter 4 will join beginning in verse 20. My son, my daughter, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. God is speaking as a parent with urgency. Pay attention. Listen carefully to my words. It's as if uh, God as our Heavenly Father, as our perfect parent, is, is, is kneeling with a young child, and looking into their eyes and saying, now listen closely to what I'm saying. Or as if God is like taking his adult children out to dinner and like a parent leans across the table to speak with urgency to a child who they love. And God shares the anatomy of God's protection with us. It's as if God is speaking. Here's the DNA sequence of vaccine to help you from the worst virus there is. You know, many people are uh, anxiously waiting for a vaccine for the coronavirus. And God uh, kind of gives us the DNA sequence 
of a spiritual vaccine that can help equip us and protect us to be faithful to follow Christ even in the midst of the most uh, hor horrific circumstances of life or some of the most seductive temptations we might experience. And the anatomy of God's protection, God uses the portrait of the human body. And in the next several verses speaks about heart, mouth, eyes, and feet. In verse 23, God speaks to us about our hearts. Verse 23, above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. We guard whatever we most treasure, don't we? Rather, it's uh, deadbolt locks because we love our family and we want to protect our family and people's lives, or a smoke detector to protect the lives of people who we care about, or an insurance policy in case anything ever happened to us, we would make sure that those we love will be cared for. We, we guard what we most treasure. We protect what we care about the most, but how much do we guard our hearts? How much do we protect our souls? Now, the word heart can be confusing because we live in a uh, uh, Western culture where so often the heart is seen as kind of a bifurcation, like, like the heart is all about emotions. But in the Hebrew construct, uh, the word heart in verse 23 is translated from the word hake. Now, lave is the Hebrew word for like a pumping heart, a physical heart. But the word hake, to guard your hake, guard your heart, is a word that really means deep. It's like the depths of the ocean. And what God is saying to the children who he loves, to you and me today is, deep down in the deepest oceans, beneath the surface, deep down within you, in the place of your greatest affections, of the appetites that really drive what you seek after, of the convictions deep down within us. God's speaking at that depth to us. Why guard our hearts? Why guard the affections within us, the, the appetites that drive us, the convictions that are core to us? Because, because our hearts, whatever's deep within us, is like a wellspring. Because whatever's below the surface will eventually spring forth and will shape who we are and how we live. Show me what's within us and we'll see what will shape our life in the future. Unless there's intervention at the depth of the heart, of the seat, of the loves that are really within us. Because let's remember that Whatever are the loves deep within our heart, that's what will shape our lives. Uh, the theologian Augustine, 1,500 years ago, wrote, the key to life change is not just the acts of the will, but the loves of the heart. I agree with that. Both hearts and habits are what shape us. But it begins with drilling down and asking, what's really happening in the depths of my heart? See, if, if the greatest love of my heart is to be accepted because I'm, I'm broken, I'm damaged because of the fall, and because of that, I, I desperately want to be loved, I definitely want to be accepted, I want to be validated, then whatever will allow us entry into that social group that we most hope for, then our hearts will chase after whatever it takes to be part of that social group, that social network, to have that status. If the greatest affection, the greatest love of our heart is, oh, we just want to get married. We so want to get married, which is a beautiful affection of the heart. But if that is the greatest affection of our hearts, then we will probably, as time pass, so lower our standards because we'll so hunger after it. And we've all known people who, when they married someone, many of their family and friends, I, say, I, I, I can't believe they're marrying that person. Or if having a wonderful family is above the affection of God. In other words, that's the greatest affection of our heart. If we have disordered loves in our heart, then what will happen is we'll really use our family, we'll raise our children to meet our own needs instead of in a godly way, nurturing them to be the people that God's created them to be. And we will either stifle our children because they're really an extension of us and we need them 
to help make sure that everybody looks at us and says, oh, you have a perfect family. Or we'll neglect any kind of discipline. And our children might run, run rampant because we're afraid that they might not love us. And because of the disordered loves of our heart, that's our greatest love. And so because of that, we'll do whatever it takes for our children to love us, even if it's what's damaging for them. The disordered loves of our hearts. See, it's good that we um, love the people in our social network. It's often good that we love our job and we find great satisfaction in it. It's, it's great that we love the concept of getting married. It's wonderful that we love our family. But when the loves of our hearts are disordered, ordered, that's when those things begin to become beautiful, but idols. And we chase after them and they will shape us and they will control us. And we can begin to wound and damage the very people who we love. So what are some of the metrics to know what's really happening within our hearts? Because our hearts can be pretty uh, deluding to us, can't they? Matter of fact, the older I get, the more I realize how seductive my heart can be because of its brokenness and its fallenness and its depravity. And so there's a few metrics. It goes from the heart to then the metrics of the mouth, the eyes, and the feet. So verse 24, we move to the mouth. Put away perversity from your mouth and keep corrupt talk from your lips. Here's the reality. Words really reflect what's within our hearts. Sometimes our words are really like vomits, right? It's like, Bleh! that's what comes out of our heart. And those are our words. See, words are really evidence of what's really happening within our hearts. And the challenge is that the Hebrew word for perversity, that we'd put away perversity from our mouths, is the Hebrew word ixus. And ixus really means to twist truth. It means something that's crooked. In other words, don't have our words be crooked, and that could be we twist the truth. Because in our hearts, uh, we need whatever affection, validation, uh, approval, so we twist the truth. Or what we say is really turning away. It's crooked from what God would call us to say. Or our words are crooked in that they like twist the knife. You know, the person who we're addressing. Now, I know it can be easy for us to think, you know, but, but I only said that because I was under a lot of stress. I only said that because um, I was really weary. I only said that because that person really bothers me. And those might have been triggers for what we said, but they're not the ultimate source. The source wasn't that we were weary. The, the source wasn't that we were anxious. The source wasn't we were under stress. The source wasn't the other person. That was the trigger. The source was really what's in our hearts or where we find our greatest identity. Rather, it's in God in which we can then begin to speak truth freely or rather we find our identity in all kinds of different external things. And when that happens, all kinds of words will come out of us because we're often so insecure that if we ever feel threatened, ooh, words come out of us. They can be so painful. And all of us, haven't we, have experienced painful words that are etched in our memories, that might even be defining us, that have wounded us, and we still remember them years later. It might be words of a parent, the words of a teacher, things said by a coach, something we've never forgotten that was said by a spouse. Maybe the words of our culture at the end of isms that can be so wounding and damaging. Words are powerful, and they're really a metric of what's happening in our hearts. What's happening with the words that we share? We move from words then to the eyes. Move down to verse 25. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. We know that, especially in the Hebrew worldview, that the eyes are the gateway to the mind. What the author's really saying is make sure your eyes look straight ahead. In other words, make sure your mind is fixed on what is true and what is beautiful and what is of God. Because the eyes are the gateway of our mind, and the mind is the greatest battlefield of our faith. Here's the challenge. What's showing in the theater of our thoughts? If we were to log in, and, and look at uh, mymind.com. 
what's showing in the theater of our thoughts. Uh, the book Beautiful Mind that was then turned into a, a really uh, poignant movie, A Beautiful Mind, uh, tells the story of John Nash, a brilliant mathematician who won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. But as the book and then the movie so uh, powerfully displays, he also struggled from paranoid schizophrenia. Matter of fact, the Nobel Committee wondered should we give him the prize because will that add a lot of stress and anxiety to him? And, and when he gives his acceptance speech, what will he say? But they realized that the work that he had done was so brilliant, had been such breakthrough. And there's a scene in the movie when Russell Crowe, who so poignantly brings to life the character of John Nash in the movie Beautiful Mind. He says this, and I've shared this before, and this is really powerful for me. He says, words of John Nash, I choose not to entertain some of the appetites of my mind. Oh. Boy, that's right out of Proverbs. I choose not to entertain some of the appetites of my mind. We need to realize what are the appetites within my heart that are shaping my mind that are then guiding me to how I think, and because of that, how I live. Now imagine with me that you're in your living room or you're in your dorm room or you're in your kitchen and, and someone enters in and whoa, you know, this person just kind of breaks in and, and they dump bags of garbage in your living room, your kitchen or your dorm room, and then they leave. Now, after we probably call the police, what are we going to do with all that garbage that's been spewed in the rooms of our house, apartment, or our dorm? I don't think most of us are going to just ignore it. You know what? I'm kind of busy. I'm kind of stressed. I have a lot going on. I have a lot of work demands. I, I, you know, we're raising our children. I have so much to do. I, I, I don't have time for that garbage. If we do that, our house, there's going to be a stench. It's going to be rotten. No, we would remove the garbage. We live in a culture that spews a lot of garbage. There's, there's a lot of garbage that, that we wrestle with in our fallen, depraved, broken minds. And it's accentuated by a culture where there's just so much garbage about uh, worldviews that might clash with the character of God or negativity or a lot of the... Um, a lot of the uh, uh, political chaos and messages that's happening, or maybe because of misogyny or pornography or temptations from our friends where we might realize that there's garbage. And if we don't intentionally do something about that garbage that's in our minds and that out of that shapes our hearts that moves our lives, that stench is eventually going to be like a wellspring and it's going to burst forth. And, uh, you know, because of that, we can so damage our lives. Sometimes we need intervention. Let's evaluate what's showing in the theater of my thoughts. Am I choosing to entertain some of the appetites of my mind that breaks God's heart because God loves us too much and knows that that can take us places that can, that can really go viral in our minds and create wreckage in our lives. Well, then we move in the anatomy of, of God's spiritual protection to our feet. Verse 26, make level paths for your feet and, and uh, take only ways that are firm. Don't swerve to the right or to the left, but keep your feet from evil. The feet in this Hebrew poetry represents our actions. Our, our feet are the way that we walk, the actions of our lives. Do we walk in wisdom? Do we take the path of God's protection? Or are we straying to the left or to the right, away from God's wisdom, from God's protection, from God's pathways? Now, this straying to the right or the left is a Hebrew figure of speech. It's a Hebrew colloquialism that we see throughout a lot of the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. And it always means the small steps, a little step to the left, a little step to the, a small step 
that one day we wake up and we realize, wow, how did I wander so far away? It's like small compromises, a little to the left, a little to the right. It isn't easy for us to think it's just a small compromise. You know, especially because I've been under such anxiety and, and stress and there's uncertainty and I need an escape. And it's so easy, small compromises where, hey, it's just, it's just a little look at that with my eyes. You know, the, the pathway, that step to the left or the right, you know, everyone else is choosing that ethical pathway. So why shouldn't I be able to? And who cares who I sleep with? And, and, and how is it any of God's business who I sleep with? You know, this little step to the left or the right, <laughs> this ethical compromise at work, this little um, compromise, it's, it's not going to hurt anyone. And you know what? That, that, that person who I've been spending more time with uh, makes me feel a lot better than my spouse, right? We have all kinds of little compromises that can start in our minds. And it might seem innocent or small or no big deal or no one's going to find out. And it's, I, I'm never going to go anywhere with this. But we've all known people, haven't we? We saw their marriage destroyed. We saw an addiction seize a hold of their life. We saw their faith shipwrecked because it started with a little step to the left or the right, unless there's intervention. What's an intervention? that God's spirit is pleading with us, calling us, beckoning us to, to repent, to, to come back to the path, not to take that step. And if we're four or eight or, or, or several steps or even miles down that path, the arms of Christ are open wide at the cross and says, come back home to the foot of the cross, nail it to the cross, come back home. I love you too much to keep straying. In this powerful proverb, God speaks as a loving parent with urgency. But ultimately, you know, God knows that we need a heart transplant. This isn't just behavior modification. It isn't simply, you know, if you just try to think a little better, and if you just try to sin a little bit less, and um, if we just look at a little bit better things, then, you know, you, we can have behavior modification. If we just grit and dig in, uh, because God knows that we can't do that. Notice how it all starts off with the uh, heart. See, God knows we need a heart transplant. Before then, out of that outflow, then that behavior modification is not just something where we're gritting it and trying to do it for reasons we don't really know. It's just like, well, God says this, so I, I better do it. But instead, what it really comes out of is that the Father who's speaking with his urgent heart to us knew we needed a heart transplant and sent his son, Jesus. Think about this. God loves you so much that he would send Jesus, that God would come in Jesus and even sacrifice his life on the cross and then would send his spirit to live within us, to guide us and lead us and convict us and shape us more like Christ. What greater love could there be in our hearts? See, if we have disordered loves in the affection of our hearts, that's where it all begins. And when we recognize, God, I, I'm a fallen, lost, depraved, broken sinner, but you love me. You're the only source of unconditional, unfathomable, perfect love. That love was in action when Jesus on the cross, you took my sins, my filth, my brokenness, and you took it on the cross and took it upon yourself. And now you've clothed me in the righteousness of Christ that, that I don't deserve the greatest trait of human history. Our sins for the righteousness of Christ. Wow. And then the spirit is beckoning us. When, when the spirit is convicting us, God never convicts us in order to condemn us. Ah, Greg, I got you on that, didn't I? That's not the character of God. God convicts us because God loves us and wants us in repentance to come back home to his heart and be shaped more by the character of Christ and be less vulnerable to chase after the things that can cause our mouth to say such damaging, wounded things or our eyes to take in and our minds to be shaped by garbage or for our feet to, 
to take paths that seem in the moment like a small compromise, but that can create pain and suffering and wreckage for us and for the people we care about. See, if, if only Jesus is number one in our hearts, in gratitude for who Jesus is and what he's done for us on the cross, then that is the real key to making wise financial choices. If only Jesus is number one on the throne of our hearts, that is the key for being wise about choosing who we will marry. If only Jesus is number one on the throne of our hearts, then that's what can begin to disarm temptations. Because in that moment, we recognize that temptation, that substance, that person, that ethical compromise, that choice, you know what? Compared to how much Jesus loves me, no way. That doesn't love me at all like Jesus does. So we have a Christocentric faith that's centered upon Jesus on the cross, God's love for us. I pray that we may drill down deep into the heart and that out of our heart will flow a love for God that will be the vaccine for the worst virus in human history. And that is the sin that lurks in our broken hearts. Whether you're part of our church family or you're a guest today, we love to connect with you. Uh, scroll down after worship and uh, look to the um, connect card. If you fill that out, it comes to me and uh, we will follow up and I'd love to uh, email, text, have a Zoom conversation, whatever. We'll, we'll help each other to follow Christ or to get you connected in our church family, in community together, where we can help each other to follow Christ together. I'm so excited that starting on November 1st, uh, we're going to be launching uh, Sunday Morning Fellowship. One of the things that I think many of us are missing is that before and after worship, Sunday mornings, I'm in the sanctuary today on purpose. Oh, how I miss seeing everyone in the sanctuary. But when we're in the sanctuary, one of the things that is so wonderful is then the conversations we have. We see each other. When we see each other sing and worship, often it helps us to have a sense of... I, I'm having a difficult time, but it's like that person just uh, sang that praise for me, or I, I own that prayer that that person prayed, or we see each other afterwards, and we have, we have coffee together, or tea together, and we have conversations together, and, and so starting November 1st at 11 o'clock every Sunday, um, hopefully what we'll do is at around 10 o'clock, we'll, we'll worship online, and then after that, at 11, we'll enter into Zoom together. Everyone who, who would like to, if there's hundreds of people, that'll be fine because we'll begin to greet each other and then we'll go into chat rooms where we'll have uh, a number of us uh, with a host who will just give us a chance to, to share what's happening in our lives, to share our joys and our burdens, uh, to reflect a little bit on that morning's message, what encouraged us, what challenged us, what are next steps to be uh, applying out of that message. And then for those who would like to stay to pray for each other. So look forward to Sunday morning fellowship, 11 o'clock every Sunday, starting on November 1st. I love you, my church family. Someday we will gather again here in the sanctuary. But until then, let's guard our hearts. And let's be a people whose love for Jesus because he so loved us. That is the guide for our lives. God bless you.
his child.